Hello. This session, I want to talk about Moore's Law and the future of Moore's Law. Moore's Law, in brief, is the idea that computers are getting twice as fast every couple of years, twice as fast for the same price. It was observed, this law was observed in the 1960s by Gordon Moore, named after him, who was first noticing that there, as he was plotting the advance and progress in transistors, that every 18 months, engineers were able to double the number of transistors they could squeeze into the same little chip. That general observation has been extended because in fact, we're no longer just packing tr transistors into chips, but if you extend Moore's law to say that it's the doubling of computer power every 18 months, we could say that that's been running for almost 60 or more years, that, there, that the curve has been pretty straight line of this doubling of computing power on a regular basis in a very even keel. Now, the, the caveat to that is, is that we're not really following Moore's original definition. We keep broadening the definition because in fact, the number of chips in a transistor or a tra printed circuit doesn't really mean much because the circuits are getting bigger and bigger because in fact, now we're beginning to have not just circuits that are flat, but actually cubic, three dimensions. And so it really isn't fair or constructive just to look at that um, because we've sort of gone beyond that. But if you generalize Moore's law to the idea that computing power keeps increasing doubling, so to speak, every three or four years, doubling every 18 months, whatever that figure is, that has proven to be very, very reliable. And the question has always been whether that is, um, wh where does that come from? Where does that law come from? What, why is it a law? Why is it so steady? And the different arguments have been well, that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that because people expected it to, that's what happens. Um, I make a different argument. I say that's much more built into the structure of physics, that once you begin to make things smaller, they run faster and cooler, and so they become better. And that kind of propels things to keep reducing in size and speed. And that, in fact, this is sort of inevitable because, as many people have noted, uh, Moore's Law was sort of operating before anybody noticed it was there. And um, that would suggest that it wasn't just self-fulfilling prophecy because in the beginning there was no prophecy while it was happening. Um, and you could also kind of read this as a kind of the, the speed of the learning curve. This is how fast it takes for people to absorb because the law is being driven in part because as we make something over and over again, we are able to make it better. and we can make it better almost in proportion to how many of them that we make. And so um, as trips became cheaper, that we made more of them. And as we made more of them, we can make them better. And so that's much more likely the cause of, of Moore's Law. But we've seen Moore's Law, like things like Moore's Law work in other domains. So Moore's Law was really this idea of computation becoming cheaper and faster. But we also see the same thing in like digital storage, where the amount of storage that we can store in a particular surface area kept increasing on a regular basis, a flat, not a flat line, but a steady line. We see um, uh, bandwidth, the ability to pump bits through a wire that also follows an own curve on a regular, very, very regular line of increasing, however, doubling 
at some regular period for decades and decades. And we can almost kind of map out where we'll be in 10 years from now. And um, that, that it's independent of even the medium. So these curves, as I said in Moore's Law, transitioned from working with integrated circuits to photonics. It, I mean, it, it, it required new technologies, whole new kinds of technologies to keep the curve going. The same thing with bandwidth. It originally, it was kind of electrons over a telephone wire. Um, but now it's photons going through a fiber optic. In order to keep that curve going, we've had to invent new, whole new technologies. And so um, that those curves transcend, so to speak, the actual technologies that they originated with. And Moore's Law as, as computation, in fact, in order to keep it going, it has to move into new technologies because we can't really reduce the size of the circuits anymore because they're already at the level where basically they're the wires are so small that all of the electrons can't really even flow on them anymore. They just kind of bounce off or they fly away. And so um, in order to keep increasing and doubling that speed that we have to use new technologies. And one of the several new possibilities is quantum computers where we're using qubits. They're not electrons at all. They're just qubits. They're these super positioned subatomic particles that are very hard and weird. And so we're trying to make computers with them to keep things going. And they just have a completely different method of measurement and, 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 and of, of working that does not apply to an integrated circuit. But what we want to get out of it is we want to get this doubling of the compute power. And another frontier in the Moore's Law trend, keeping us going, is um, Photonics, light. So light actually moves much faster than electrons do. Electrons are moving through wires and they, while it seems fast to us, relative to the speed of light is very, very slow. If you can send light through a cable, it's much, much faster. And it's what we use in transatlantic and transpacific communication. We were sending light through the cables rather than electrons on the wire. And the movement now is to try to use that light in a circuit as, as the photons flow around the logic gates, just like electrons used to do. And the potential speeds are much, much greater, which is an important thing in Moore's Law. So it's not just how many transistors can you pack into it. There are other considerations like the speed, the volume, how, many, how much stuff can you go through, how many you circuits can do all at once, doing things in parallel. And so um, these are the frontiers that we've had to move to keep more of law going, is kind of expanding, saying, yeah, we're going to still get our twice the doubling of the compute power per dollar, but we're not going to talk about transistors anymore. We're going to be talking about compute power, cycles, operations per second. And so um, photonics is one of the frontiers in circuits. And another frontier is the analog. So ironically, there's a limit. There are limits from what happens when you do bits, digital, off, on, off, on, off, on. Our bodies, our brains don't work that way. We have analog single sine curves where things are continuous and right, not discrete off, on, the continuous modes that have gradations and variations. And that's another frontier that we're exploring is analog computing. Because it's not discrete, it has powers that have not been tapped by discrete binary digital thinking. And so um, quantum computing, analog computing, Optical computing are three frontiers that are going to be more prevalent in the next 30 years as we move 
computation into those to keep Moore's laws going. There will still be an awful lot of computation that will happen in very traditional electronic silicon circuits, which will probably never go away. But if we want to see the speed increases that we are expecting, we will probably need to move into these other realms of quantum analog or photonics. And it's really important to be able to do this because almost all the progress that we have seen in our lives and that we're surrounded by every day, all the expectations we have about new technology are all dependent on the fact that it gets cheaper every year. If, if, if computers did not get cheaper every year, if they got more expensive every year, or if they didn't change at all, that would really change how we would view modern life. It would really change what we would do. If, if we knew, well, okay, five years from now, computers were going to be cost, cost exactly the same, not be any more powerful. That's a very different world than the world we live in, where we now have an intuitive expectation that next year things will be cheaper and faster. And so um, if Moore's Law was to collapse, if it was to stop in its general aspect, that would be a huge diversion, setback, readjustment, resetting necessary for our understanding of what the modern world was about. Because we have intuitively picked up this expectation that the phones are going to get better and better every year. That the, the, the you know the technology itself will be improving, but all that improvements that we expect generally for society at large all come to rest on Moore's law improvements. And if that doesn't work, nothing else works. So it's really important about whether Moore's law it does continue or not in the general sense. And um, I feel that these three things suggest that it will. I could be totally wrong. But if I am, it really is a major adjustment. If I am right, that means that we can expect fundamental worldwide progress of a huge degree in the next 20 years, all because more of all continues with the three things that I'm suggesting.